Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to midweek. Um, I want to call this the third week of Lent. It's actually Lent 2 because Ash Wednesday is the first week. But we are still in the midst of contemplating how sinful we are and how much we need forgiveness, which is a good place for sinners to be because they go to the only place that sinners have to go to to find forgiveness. Um, It's always a little bit, to me, of a downer to be in Lent because it just makes me realize how truly sinful, you know, we really are. I guess, well, how I really am and how much I really need to look to the cross and toward that empty tomb. And tonight in our our John text, we're going to talk about uh, Malchus. And there's no reason you should know who that guy is unless you read ahead because he's only mentioned once, only in that gospel, um, when he his ear is cut off by by Peter. And, you know, what does that mean uh, for our message tonight? You know, we're going to talk about how how difficult it is to let go of control. At least it is for me. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the message. But right now, as you are able, will you please rise as we sing, "Lay, Lay My Sins on Jesus. And we begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You have searched me, O Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is my time, you Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. 
we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have turned away from you and pursued idols of power, control, comfort, and approval. Our desires for these idols have kept us from trusting in you with our whole heart and loving our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins and turn us again to you. Enable us by your Spirit to delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake, he forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks be to God. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. sins of the people. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. He was delivered up to death. He was delivered for the sins of the people. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He was delivered up to death. He was delivered for the sins of the people. Please be seated.
And our first reading for tonight comes from the prophet Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God. Smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions and he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. Our second reading is from 2 Corinthians, the first chapter. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God in Corinth, together with all the saints throughout Achaia, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praised be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. For just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As you are able, will you rise? The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 18th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. When he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side, there was an olive grove, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the grove, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. And Judas the traitor was standing there with them all. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, Who is it you want? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth, I told you that I am he. Jesus answered, if you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. On January 17, 2004, a 66-ton sperm whale died and washed up on the beach on the southwestern coast of Taiwan. Two weeks later, authorities put it on a truck and tried to take it to a laboratory so they could do an autopsy, if you can imagine that. It took 50 men and three lifting cranes and 13 hours to get the whale onto that flatbed trailer so they could truck him down to the laboratory. People poured into the streets of this city to see this whale being carted down down the streets of their town. And then it happened. As the truck crawled through the city, 
the crowds looking on at this huge thing, the whale exploded. That's right, the whale exploded. The insides of the whale splattered cars, people, and local shops. Traffic stopped for hours. The smell was almost unbearable. I'll bet no one saw that coming. I sure wouldn't have. Isn't that just like life sometimes? We're going about our business and a whale explodes all over our life. And all of a sudden, we're in a huge mess we never saw coming. We're left hurt and confused with lots of questions that begins with this word. Why? Why did my spouse leave me? Why did they have to die so young? Why did we lose so much money? Why does our son or daughter or mother or father continue to cause us so much pain? Why, why, why? Well, I want to greet you this evening with grace and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. We come to John 18 and we meet Malchus. And like I said, this dude is not mentioned anywhere else in the Bible and not in any of the other Gospels, just in John. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Malchus was going about his business, doing the job that he was called to do, doing his duty. And before he knows it, his whale explodes. Can you imagine sitting there and all of a sudden your right ear is swiped off with a sword? by a fisherman from Galilee. No one saw that coming. The crowd collects. Now, Judas, who betrayed him, he also knew the place. For Jesus often met there, as it said in the text with the disciples. So Judas himself, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers and chief priests and Pharisees, went there with lanterns, torches, and weapons to arrest Jesus. Roman soldiers will come into picture the next day. That's when they will mock, flog, and then crucify Jesus. The crowd that collects here is a crowd of Romans who controlled the country. They were the government. The chief priests who controlled the temple and the Pharisees who controlled the religion. So comparatively, this would be like the Supreme Court and Congress sending the feds or even soldiers to arrest this one man. And who's leading this Jewish posse with all this firepower and muscle? Judas. And what is Judas up to? Well, it's no secret. Betrayal. And every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper, this is how we always begin it when we say the words of institution, on the night on which he was betrayed. This was that night. The chaos commences, then Simon Peter, having drawn a sword and struck the high priest's servant, cut off his right ear. Peter cuts off Malchus' right ear for trying to seize Jesus. The crowd collects for Malchus. That is when the whale exploded. Has a mess ever suddenly appeared in your life out of nowhere? Are you doing everything you can to survive? Have you had to call the bank? Have you had to change your diet? Have you had to go on a whole bunch of new meds? Have you had to call an attorney? Have you had to tighten your budget? Have you had to go into counseling or even rehab? Well, if you have, just remember, don't give up. Don't give up, because I want to comfort you with these words, which to me is not very comforting at most times. You are not in control. I'm a control freak when it comes to making sure my life goes a certain way. And those are not always comforting words to me. But we are not in control. Who is in control? Judas and the Jews and the Romans appear to be in control right now. They appear to be. Christ is really, really the one who is in control. And how is that? They got all this muscle and weapons and they control everything in that region, religion, government, power. But Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, came forward willingly. He didn't hide. When his enemies come, Christ goes out to meet them. 
When Judas approaches, Christ doesn't run. He knows what's about to happen. He knows the cup he's going to have to drink. And when Peter strikes Malchus, Christ commands Peter to put his sword away. Because Jesus is doing this to fulfill Scripture so that we can be forgiven. That's part of what's going on here. Listen to what Jesus says. This is from John 10. No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. They don't get to do this to him unless he allows it to happen. And though the powers of darkness arise against him full throttle, Christ is in control. And in Matthew's gospel, it points out to us that Jesus could call down more than 12 legions of angels. It's 72,000. But Christ doesn't need any of them because he is in control. During World War II, psychologists compared ground troops with fighter pilots and determined that after 60 days of continuous combat, the anxiety of the ground troops was way off the charts. After 60 days, though an astounding 93% of the fighter pilots were happy and at peace. Why is that? The fighter pilots had control of their planes. They had their hand on the throttle. Ground troops, on the other hand, felt helpless. They could be killed running, going, hiding, whatever they were doing. They were not in control of anything. We don't need a war to prove that to us, that control taken out of our hands is a scary thing. All we need is a backup on an interstate highway. One of the worst places for me to ever be, even if I have no place to go, is to be stuck in traffic. A team of researchers recently found that a traffic jam triples our chances of having a heart attack. So I'm going to have to remember that. (laughs) That's why popular wisdom always tells us in a crisis, try and take control. It does me. I even try to do it to prevent crisis. Oh, I want to do this and do that, white-knuckled, so I can stop an unforeseeable event from sneaking up on me. Control and trying to control all kinds of stuff, and I don't have control of a single bit of it. Rather than seek control, we should relinquish it. You know why? Because it doesn't work. Give it up. Let it go. I liked this. I saw this uh, verse or this uh, phrase in here. Resign as CEO of the universe. And that's something I've had to, to do once in a while. And this was to fulfill the word he had spoken. Those you gave me, I have not lost one. Christ is calm through this mess, through this wail, because he trusts and knows that God's word is being fulfilled. And Christ's calm is contagious. In a Peanuts comic strip, Lucy is struggling with her Sunday school memory verse. Finally, she suggests that maybe it may be a verse from the book of Reevaluations. And if you know Lucy, anything about Lucy, she's an aspiring psychoanalyst, so she's constantly evaluating everyone. The scriptures are a book of reevaluations. They help us reevaluate who is really in charge. Who's really calling the shots? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world in John 1. Jesus knows what will prevent us from spending an eternity with him. So, through this, through the beginning of what's happening right now, he's going to take away our sins, go to the cross, walk out of the tomb. Whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. Christ is in control of what we thirst for. I am the light of the world. Christ is in control of the darkness. He is the light and the darkness cannot overcome it. When you who have kids and send your kids to camp, you have to sign a form that asks you this question, who is the responsible party? In case your son or daughter breaks their arm or breaks out with the measles or whatever could happen at camp, a whole lot of stuff. So you sign your name. 
Well, Christ signed his name for us. And he wrote it in his own blood. He took full responsibility for us, for our lives here and into the next. When the whale explodes, when your life becomes messy, Jesus is the responsible party. It's not his fault, but he is in control. You are not. I am not. It's his job to see us through. Christ is the shepherd and we are the sheep. I say stuff, we say stuff as pastors like that all the time. But me, myself, that's hard for me to remember sometimes when I'm in a mess. Christ is the bridegroom. We are the bride. He is the rabbi, the teacher, and we are his disciples. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness, not our own. And that's good news. So, one of three things is happening in our lives right now. We are either heading for a mess, we are in a mess, or we have just come through a mess. No matter what, we don't have to become hopeless, anxious, or faithless in whatever one of those stages we happen to be in. Why? When the whale explodes... Jesus can deliver peace. And there's peace in us knowing that we are not in control. And like Malchus's ear, when our whale hits us, Jesus reaches out to heal us. I'm sure Malchus didn't expect this man who he had come to seize would heal him. But that's what Jesus does. When the mess hits our lives. And though we contemplate sin. And our unworthiness through Lent. God bless us to always remember that. In Jesus name. Amen. And at this time we just want to remind you of. How we give what the Lord has first given us. And how grateful we are of your giving and your support of our ministries here.
invite you to stand. Let us pray. Loving Father, we rejoice in the great gift of your Son and pray that you may find joy in the gifts that we bring. Help us to give ourselves more freely and fully to you, to each other, trusting in your love to provide for our every need. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For peace and salvation, for reconciliation and unity, let us pray to the Lord. For the strengthening of our faith and the spreading of the gospel, let us pray to the Lord. For the leaders of this church and all of its ministries and staff, let us pray to the Lord. For those who reject Jesus or do not know him, those who have been hurt by the church and those who persecute Christians, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for this nation, for our cities and communities, and for the common welfare of us all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have for the unborn, the abused, the forgotten, and the lost, let us pray to the Lord. For the hungry, the widowed, and orphaned, and for all those in prison, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the unemployed, the underemployed, and those struggling to make ends meet, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those battling addiction, depression, anxiety, and suicidal thoughts, let us pray to the Lord. For those who are sick, injured, or recovering from surgery, especially in our prayers tonight, we remember Julie Kuntzman, who had surgery this Monday, Dave Buss, James Ashbrenner, Marilyn Spieth, Tina Sapola, and Tammy Vanke's mother. Let us pray to the Lord. For those in hospice care and those who grieve the death of a loved one, Especially, we remember the family of Janet Spaulding, whose sister-in-law was in a tragic accident last week. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The blessing of Almighty God the Father, who saw man's, mankind's hopeless condition, the Son who showed the depth of God's love, and the Holy Spirit who has opened our eyes of faith in Christ, be upon you now and forever.